Welcome to Global Citizen Life. Today on the podcast, we have Mike Mall joining us. Mike is a marketing coach who helps solopreneurs unlock profitability through simplicity. He focuses on creating sustainability rather than aggressive growth by optimizing pricing and systems. Mike runs his companies while traveling full time with a team spread across North America. He hopes to help others who want to create an amazing business while having time for travel, hobbies, and enjoying life. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you so much for having me, Sally. So can you tell our listeners a little bit about um, where you started out, where you're at now, and and what brought you there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm from Canada. And so I grew up just outside of Toronto. Uh, I lived most of my adult life in the city, uh, Vancouver, for a few years. I had always had this desire to travel, but I was just never good at planning and going, you know. And so I had, you know, kind of never been to Europe. I had been to a few all-inclusive places before, but I never traveled, like really traveled. Um, I was lucky to meet a partner who just had this like, let's just go attitude to her. And she like really pushed me and forced me to, to into the idea. You know, I, for a lot of years, I worked in scenarios and in companies that didn't, wouldn't have allowed me to be able to travel. Um, But in 2013, I started my own business. It's been, you know, fully remote forever. Um, And, you know, that gave me that, that first little push into like, oh, this is possible. This could happen. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I've been running a marketing agency for the past decade, uh, also coaching businesses, which is newer. It's been the past couple of years. But through that journey and through that, you know, uh, location freedom, I've been able to, you know, spend meaningful time in Europe. I primarily live in Mexico. I lived in Africa for a little bit as well. So just kind of floating, experiencing culture. I haven't gone to Asia yet because that time zone to operate the business is a nightmare. (laughs) Um, But everywhere else, I'm I'm, yeah trying to get out there. I I understand that too. I haven't spent much time in Asia, and I really want to. And every time I think about it, I just think the time zone issue is an issue. Like it's going to be a, a tough challenge to to deal with for sure. Yep. And so you're you're now living in in Mexico. So did you go through the whole residency process there? I did. What was funny is a lot of my friends and and people that I knew had gone through this. Hey, we, you know, we got our temporary, which is a one year for four years. It just has to be renewed every year for four years, and then you can apply for permanent residency myself being the marketer and like I've always been a challenger of rules I'm looking at the requirements and I just thought wait a minute I make enough money to be a permanent resident why am I going through why am I going through the process of temporary residency and doing this long four-year process so I met with an attorney here pitched the idea and I said what's the worst case scenario and it turns out the worst case scenario is if they decline you for permanent they just set you into temporary which is the four year. And I was like, well, and I said, well, what's the drawback He's, well, they don't like giving people your age. It's more of like a retirement visa. And I said, okay, but what it like, what if they don't, well, you can try. So I I flew to um, Kansas city and did the the interview there at the consulate. And I went in for permanent and they're like, yeah, okay. Let me meet all the qualifications. You're good to go. So I jumped straight to permanent resident right away. Wow. So note to to everybody listening that just read through the rules, see what's there. And you never know, you can you can skip a lot of that bureaucracy that would have happened every year of having to renew and go through that just by taking a chance and uh, knowing the rules. And that's fantastic. Yeah. And my my bigger feeling on that is I noticed that some of the Asian countries and some places in Europe are starting to change their rules around the golden visas, around the digital nomad visas, around the requirements of taxing and implications that way. And so for me, if you're thinking about it or if you're in transit or in the process of it while you're hearing this, it's like take the action now, because I think in the next five years, the rules in the world of, of this, you know, dual residency thing is going to start to change a lot because it's right now it's prime to take advantage 
and it's like get it done while you can get it done and I know your firm helps with things like that so Absolutely. Things are things are changing constantly. And there is more of, um, shall we say, like a crackdown on those um, citizenship by investment programs, for sure. Um, and, and some of those citizenship programs, what people need to be aware of, too, sometimes, and, and I think it all depends on kind of, sometimes we need to know what the, those long term goals are, because the digital nomad visas, Although a lot of people think they're easy and convenient, they are. But sometimes with them, your income requirements are higher than other visas and residency, temporary residency programs. And if you do end up wanting to stay and become permanent residents, a lot of times those digital nomad visas, the years that you spend, do not qualify towards that temporary or permanent residency and so right. people really need to be careful with with those things. So sometimes it's better to go for the the temporary or if they can, as you did, write for the permanent residency, as opposed to doing the digital nomad or or other things. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it, it's it's impossible, you know, as a traveler, sometimes it's like this feeling of, oh, it's impossible to know, you know, where I'm going to want to be in the long term. But I think it's it's the idea of just getting something that locks you in even if your mind changes even if you pursue something later it's like i think with the traveler the mindset is like oh i'm just temporarily in each thing and you know setting up these structures feels permanent but the tax implications can be so profound that it's like just bite the bullet and do that and then even if you change in five years then pursue something else but it's better to just have something established and it's certainly been the case for me Right. And a lot of people, too, need to be aware of, as you said, with the tax implications, like we still have to file taxes no matter where we live in the world. If we're even just a traveling nomad, as we call it, in three months here, four months there, two months here, then you have to be filing. Generally, then it goes back to your home country or you know, some people go by the 183 day rule, which Yes and no, it's it's just not that simple, but it's a simple way to remember. But we still need to be filing taxes. And so if you're roaming around, then you would lean back to, to your home country. But if you become a tax resident in a country where the taxes are lower than home, you can still travel, you can still go places and do things. Um, but then you're, you're a tax resident there, and that's going to be the percentage of taxes depending on that country. And they vary greatly from country to country. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they do. So with your, your business, Mike, so is it incorporated within Mexico or is it incorporated elsewhere? Yeah, elsewhere. So I actually have spent quite a bit in testing this thesis of tax-free, um, you know, different tax attorneys in the U S and tax, you know, accountants and just in different places. And so the way I net it out for myself is I, I don't really plan on spending time. I haven't spent time. I haven't had healthcare in Canada in years. I'm just never there. And so um, I've become a non-tax resident of Canada. So I've mm -hmm. kind of lit, you know, put myself out. So I'm out of the tax system there. I have an LLC in the United States. Okay. But that LLC, because it's owned 100% by a foreign entity, it classifies uh, under this category of a disregarded entity, which means that it doesn't have an individual to assign a tax um, implication to or responsibility to. Um, and as a result, that makes the LLC that I formed in Wyoming tax free. And then in Mexico, my filing requirements are to declare my income from an outside of Mexico source, but not pay tax on it. Right. So I don't, I don't have a tax implication there either, which is great. Now there are some rules within the U S thing. If I get an employee or I get an office or I build structure there, there's implications. If I travel mm -hmm. to the U S on business, I host a retreat. I go there for consulting. I have to pay tax on the net profit earned through that. But if as long as I stay out, even if my customers are in the United States, um, it, it keeps me qualified as a disregarded entity there. So it's been, yeah, amazing. That structure has been great for me. Well, it's an, it's important to know the proper structures because it can save us a lot of money in in taxes. Um, and and I, I say to people, too, I mean, we're never truly tax free because we pay taxes when we purchase stuff. 
I mean, if we really look at it as business owners, we get taxed as a company, the corporation gets taxed. Then the money that we make from it as a personal income gets taxed. Then as we spend that money, we just pay tax again. So if, as long as we can limit some of those things, it's it's uh, a great way to uh, to really do it and and save some of our money that we work for. Yeah, and I remember the last time I paid, you know, full income tax in Canada. Uh, you know, it was I think forty six or forty seven percent. That's a lot. And it, like it almost feels like a disincentive to make money. You're like, why, why make so much? I'm going to lose it all anyway. I mean, that's a little dramatic, but there is this fine line of, of this threshold mm-hmm. where you're like, why would I make more than X? Because I jump up in percent. So unless the jump is from, you know, the top of this tax bracket to the top of the next one, there's this, there's a space in the middle that doesn't actually make sense for you to make that money anymore. And so, you know, very strange incentivized program. Right, right. No, I, I completely, completely agree. And so what, uh, what is day to day life like in Mexico? Yeah, so it's not so different than it was in Toronto. Obviously, we don't deal with the winter. So that's a mm-hmm. huge blessing. You know, huge. our, our the wind, the winter here is, you know, 25 during the day and 12 at night. <laughs> so you put on a sweater and some pants, no problem. Um, you know, it it has there's some luxuries that you would have in Canada that you don't have in a country like Mexico, certainly. Um, but I would say for the most part, you know, I like to get up super early. Uh, I like to work out. I've got a great space here in my house to work, um, you know, work out, jump in the pool. Uh, I like to try and tackle my entire day before noon, kind of have everything that I need to have done before noon. Um, <laughs> am I wasting the rest of the day? Sometimes <laughs> I've actually just, just started another, uh, company. So I'm, you know, the afternoons are now building this new, this new thing, but you know, it has all the things that you'd want to have. You can go, you know, there's world-class restaurants. Um, there's all the entertainment you would want, you know, the the movies, bowling, uh, different activities. The nice thing, the thing I love about Mexico, especially in where I am in Puerto Vallarta from October through June, it's going to be, you know, almost the same temperature every day. It's going to rain three times in eight months. Like it's just, you can just be outside frequently. So, you know, beach, paddleboarding, surfing. I love being near or on the ocean. That that brings me a lot of joy. Um, yeah, so mostly that. And what about comparably for cost of living? Like I know you've been out of Canada for a while now, but um, what like average expenses going out to eat? What is... Compared to if you were living the same lifestyle in Canada, what is that price difference now between Mexico and Canada? So I would say if you combine everything, it's like minus 30%, give or take. So, you know, for but so for here, specific to PV, it's a very booming place. The real mm-hmm. estate market is very mature here. So, you know, uh, an apartment rental. So, for example, I pay 1200 a month. Now, I also, you know, it is a three bedroom house with a pool. So it's a big space, but it's 1200 US per month. So, you know, let's call it 1500 Canadian. So that is probably half. That's probably half of what I'd be paying for an equivalent in Canada. So that's a big difference. Uh, I would say restaurants, you know, if you go to the, you know, the local kind of hidden spots, you know, then we're talking about a 50% savings. Otherwise, it's closer to 10 to 15%, especially if you're drinking alcohol, you know, that you're going to pay, you know, eight to 10 bucks for a drink in a nice restaurant, which you're going to pay that in Canada. Although the last few times I've been back to Canada, the pricing up there is getting pretty insane. Um, groceries, yes. if you go to a supermarket, not too different. Uh, if you go to the local markets, you can save a bit. Um, but I would say if you kind of took everything, you know, your entertainment, mm-hmm. your eating, your, um, your rent, utilities, all that stuff. I'd say you're you're about 30 to 40% cheaper here. Now, there are towns and there are cities where you're, you're the pricing hasn't escalated as much as it has here. You know, you could be living at 50 to 60% reduction, but where I am, yeah, I'd say 30 to 35%. Great. Great. It's uh it makes a big difference. Yeah, Canada is becoming very expensive. Um I was there not that long ago and I was in Denver for a conference as well and um, the price is just eating out uh, at the hotel. Now, obviously, it's a hotel. It's 
probably more than other just restaurants, but still it, uh, it was uh, very expensive compared to um, Spain and other places where I spend uh, a lot of my time. So a big difference there. Now, what about banking? Do you have a bank account in Mexico? So I currently do not. It is something okay. that I plan to get. So right now I have I use Mercury, which is a digital first bank for the business in the United States. So I got an EIN number that allowed me to open the bank account there through the LLC. So I keep a majority of my cash in there. And then I have, um, I still have my Canadian bank account. So I asked them and I actually got this in writing because there's nowhere in the actual terms and conditions. So I actually got the bank to write an email to me saying, please confirm that what you told me on the phone is how you're positioning this. So I was actually allowed to keep my credit card at its current limit and my okay. Canadian bank account um, to continue operating even as a non-tax resident. So I, and again, it felt weird because it's like the credit card, are you sure? And they're like, kind of like, can you just put it in writing? So I feel like, so they did, I have it. So I keep my Canadian bank account and then I keep a decent amount of money in WISE. So that's a digital <laughs> bank, probably amongst travelers. You're like, yeah, of course I know WISE. But for me, WISE allows me to wire money in at a very low cost from my business in USD into WISE. It allows me to convert that money into pesos at to me, the most reasonable rate, you can wait, you know, you can set an, an alert inside of WISE. So it's like when it gets to this conversion rate, I want to move the money and you pay WISE for every transaction and every fee. But to be honest, it still beats any traditional banking system by a mile. The thing I love about WISE as well is, you know, my, my rent here, I can wire the money directly to my, you know, the owner's bank account. I can pay my Spanish teacher. I can wire the money directly to her bank account. I send, you know, 1200 US per month for rent and I pay eight pesos, which is like, you know, give Nothing. or take 45, 50 cents to send that money uh, every month. So the costing is very low. The only drawback with WISE is when you want to take money out from an ATM. So they also charge a fee for that on top of the Mexican bank accounts or the Mexican bank's fees. So you know, taking cash out, I trend, I tend to take quite a bit out at once just to save that. And that's actually the only reason re why I really want the Mexican account, because I can use WISE to pay for my, you know, groceries at restaurants. I can use it and it takes the money in the pesos, which is great. But yeah, the banking transactions, when I need cash, it's a little brutal. <laughs> Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the same. I still have my Canadian bank account. Um, I've got several different bank accounts cause I've lived in different countries. Um, and I also use wise as well. They are by far the best for, as you said, those transfers, sending money, receiving money, um, using, and I have it in, in different funds. So if I'm in the U S and I'm using my card, I just make sure I have funds in my U S part of it. And it just takes U S if I'm in Europe, it just takes the, from the European account and it makes it very convenient and, and very easy. So it definitely is a, a great card to have. Yeah. Yeah. And wise, if you're listening and we know you are, you should be a sponsor <laughs> of this podcast, get in there. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what I got to do. I've got to hit them up and get some sponsorship from them. Um, yeah. But yeah, they're 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 definitely, uh, and I, I recommend them all the time um, to people. Uh, those those transfers. I even uh, when I purchased property, um, I used Wise as opposed to doing a wire transfer from my bank because it saved me thousands of dollars. Um, it was a little bit, you know, a couple extra steps to go through to make sure it really was me because. I was sending a lot of money and, and they just wanted to make sure it was all good. But yeah, I've had uh, great experiences with them. And, and I truly believe no matter where people live in the world, it really is important to have more than one bank account, have money in, in different ones. Just, we never know what's going to happen. Sometimes our governments get a little crazy and decide to freeze our bank accounts. Um, sometimes uh, I've known people who have had to deal with identity theft uh, or, you know, I don't know for sure, but if a bank gets hacked, if any of those things happen, we don't have access to our money that's in that account. And so I always recommend to people to have, if they can, an, a bank account in another country or at least um, something online likewise, where they could have some money in there and still uh, pay their bills and get groceries and things while whatever issues are getting resolved. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.
Right. So what about your business? How how does that work? Obviously, you're doing a lot of things online because you're still doing some traveling and you're you you've got it down pretty good where you're doing most of your stuff, as you said, in the morning. And, and now you're you're starting up this new one. And so how does that work with with your team? Yeah, so the team is now even spread out even a little further. I just brought on a hire from Pakistan. Um you know, the, the internet's such a funny place. It was this conversation thread in a Facebook group. And it was just the way she wrote it was just very like witty and punchy. It was very funny. And I said, who is this person? It was an anonymous group entrant and uh, just got to talking. And I said, hey, this is what I would do in your scenario if you're looking to get hired from a company outside of your home country, blah, blah, blah. And so my inbox got flooded with job applications. Uh, and the only person that that sent me exactly what I said I'd recommend was her. And I was like, all right, we got to talk. Hired her the next morning. She's been amazing. So, you know, we've got time difference. Um, but, but the truth is, yeah, so we've been fully online since 2013. So from a comms standpoint, we use, you know, Asana to manage all the pro- projects and make sure everybody's getting their work done. Uh, we use Slack for communication. Google Meet over Zoom. The reason I like Google Meet is because we're already using Google Drive and Google Docs and Google everything. The nice thing about Google Meet is when you record those meetings, it's just automatically in your Google Drive. So if I record a training or I record a coaching call, it's just like we can just move it into the client folder and we don't have to download it from Zoom and re-upload it. So that's been a big time saver for us. And I think the biggest thing is just collaborative tech, right? And so, you know, we use products like Descript, which allows us to upload a video, edit the video, but we can, multiple people can be doing it at the same time. Same thing with Canva, with my, you know, my social media graphics or my sell sheets or whatever the case may be. You know, we can have three or four people in a document at one time on a call talking about it, making live changes. And so, you know, we've really leaned into like, what are the tools they might not be the perfect tools. It's not Photoshop. Canva is not Photoshop. It doesn't have the same capability, but the speed and agility of collaborative online tools is just, to me, has been such a game changer. So, you know, I I do coaching. I work with primarily marketing agency owners. It was something that I started about eight years into my journey that I help them basically focus. I help them cut out all the fat find the most profitable thing they can do, lean into that, grow, and then decide what they want. Like, let's make money before we're changing so many things. And so that's my focus. That's a bit more challenging. That keeps me out of Asia because that's me. That's me one-on-one, you know, an hour every other week having that call. And I need to be on the right time zone. The other business is basically a new marketing agency. I plan on pulling myself out of it within the first eight months. Uh, So I'm just building all the infrastructure right now and kind of going through those processes. So it's been fun, but yeah, you know, we tend to meet three times a week. I'm a big 15 minute meeting guy. Like I think people get on, I think people get on for 30 minutes to an hour because that's the default. Like when they go to set up a new calendar, that's the default time it starts with. Uh, But even with my customers, you know, book in a 15 minute time slot. Let's get what we need to get done. Let's have that conversation. Like, What are we booking an hour for? (laughs) You know, so really for me, it's about, creating that efficiency and then using as much technology as humanly possible to streamline and make sure things don't get missed. And so, you know, my tech bill is around 1100 bucks a month. Um, but in my opinion, it replaces two people. Right. So for me, it's, we really, I really lean into that and I really lean into, you know, a short, efficient operating procedure. I would have to work on that short, short part, efficient. Yeah, not too bad operating though. For me, I those short meetings, I just, um, I don't know. They just, I don't want to say that they don't work for me, but I guess even, um, it, it's just, just doesn't seem like 15 minutes is enough time to get done or talked about what needs to be talked about. Yeah. One thing that really helped me with that is so when, when somebody books into my calendar, so a team member is like, I need to work on, I'm working on this. or we need to review this. So there's two pieces. Number one is loom. We leverage loom more than anything. So that's, you know, you're recording your screen and you're asking the question. Oftentimes I will watch that video, understand what the problem is because I'm watching their screen and they're explaining what they need. I will report a loom back and that actually eliminates 
70% of meetings to begin with. So for me, on the upside, that's like, that's a big game changer. But when we do need to meet, when we do need to go in more depth, what's worked really well for me and my Calendly for my 15 minute team meetings is uh, what is the subject matter? What is the link so I can look at this ahead of time? And what is the one thing we're looking to accomplish on this meeting? Because you can go in and it, you know, your conversation can evolve and you can start, oh, you know, I, something on this landing page but it's related to this and related to that and this other marketing thing. Right. It can go on and on and on. So it's like, what is the one thing we're trying to accomplish? So we both go in and we're like, this is the goal. The goal is to get an answer on this particular problem. And so what happens is when we land in the meeting, it's just, we just start. And usually within the first three to five minutes, we have all the information. Within the next two or three minutes, we solve the problem. And then we can use the next eight to expand and go on. But if we don't go in with that hyper focus, it's very easy for meetings to flow into 30 minutes, 40 minutes chatting going on. And so having that focus and having that intention going into the meeting has been really good for reducing meeting length for me. No, that makes sense. Um, and I do use Loom as well. I think it's a great tool um, because sometimes we, but when we're trying to even type or send in an email, this isn't working. I've tried here, clicked that. It's like, what? What are you doing? And so using Loom is is also a definitely a, a great tool for, for people. If they're unaware of it, they should definitely check it out. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Mike, um, if some people wanted to work with you, what would be the best way for them to get in touch with you and work with you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you can check me out at Mike Mall, M-O-L-L dot C-O, unfortunately not com dot C-O. There's a guy, another Mike Mall that has the dot com and he will not give it up. He's driving me crazy. He's not doing anything <laughs> with it. I'm like, come on, man. He's from Canada, too. I was like, fellow Canadian. Oh, Really? Canadians yeah, are supposed yeah, to be yeah. so nice. <laughs> right? Passive aggressive Canadians. <laughs> but yeah, uh, you can find me at mikemall.co.co. Uh, or if you just want to chat or say hi, you can find me on Instagram at the Mike Mall. Perfect. And we will have those links in the show notes for sure. And so, Mike, just one final kind of um, question. If people, you know, they're on the fence, they they kind of want to move, they're not really sure, they're nervous, they're, they're scared, or they're a little bit worried about it, what's a piece of advice that you would give to them? Make the decision. We sat on the fence, my partner and I, for years. Now, we also had, you know, I had significant family health challenges, like multiple people with cancer all at the same time. It was like we were in the hospital day and night. Um, but even kind of at the tail end of that, it was always this looming like, oh, but you know, th this could go wrong. Or what if this happens? What if that happens? And finally, we just said, here's the date we're leaving. We bought a ticket. And there was this point of no return. Where we were like, okay, we now have 45 days to figure out what we're going to do with our apartment and this and this and that. But it was until we made the decision and just bought the ticket and said, we are going, we are going to live our life. We are going to create this experience for ourselves. Even if we come back, whatever, we'll sample it for four months. We just got to see what it's like. Uh, that was the best. The decision was the best decision. And that's just forcing yourself because your actions will start to flow into what's going to make that happen. Once the plane ticket's there and the accommodation is booked, then what are you going to do? Not show up. And so it just really like pushes you to take the actions required because if you're just thinking about it and you're just theorizing, you can always find a million reasons why it's not going to work, a bunch of reasons why it's not a good idea, why it's not responsible, all this other stuff that you just get caught up in your head. So if you just decide, buy a ticket, there's no return and you just, you know, you have to do it. And what you'll find very quickly is it's a lot easier than you think. And a lot of the reasons and a lot of the excuses and a lot of the what ifs that you had building up and you let slow you down in the decision making process in the first place are completely irrelevant. And uh, it'll be the best decision you make. Man, that's a perfect answer. So I just want to say, Mike, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. I know our listeners got some valuable information and hopefully some of them will be in touch with you. Awesome. Thanks a lot for having me.